um, about the topics and um, from our website and from other websites that I think are helpful. And of course, um, you're welcome to call me or call one of our region other regional offices. Um, just for my knowledge, um, if, if you could use one of the um, emoticons to indicate um, do you, if you have experience with um, reasonable accommodations and assistive technology requests. It looks like a, a couple people, maybe maybe less than a fifth. Okay, so I'm going to then assume that this is a new topic um, for the majority of you. So um, hopefully this will be a good introduction. That was my intention in designing it. Okay, so um, the parts that I've broken today's discussion into uh, first, we'll talk about um, a very general overview about federal and state laws uh, that protect um, individuals with disabilities from employment discrimi discrimination and provide for reasonable accommodation requests. Um, and my goal for that this piece is really just to situate you in, in language and also the names of relevant statutes. Um, and to see what is available federally, what is available in California, uh, what are the similarities, what are the differences. The second part of the discussion will be the real kind of guts of today, which is reasonable accommodation requests um, and how to negotiate um, with an employer a request, a need for, for assistive technology. And then what rights do employers have? Uh, do they have to provide everything ever asked for? So I'm calling that employer defenses. The third part will be um, to just talk about what a, a prospective employee or current employee, what rights they have um, if an employer, employer um, says no. Um, I've noticed that discrimination and the words discrimination and including uh, on the slide are in bold and that there's no real reason for that. So it's not to highlight something of particular importance. Um, and the last thing is towards the throughout the webinar and at the end I've provided a number of resources. So just we'll just take a look at those. So um, a few words about where I work. Um, I work for a nonprofit organization called Disability Rights California. It might also be familiar to to you as Protection and Advocacy Inc. Uh, we changed our name a few years ago. Uh, we're a state, statewide, federally funded, and partially state funded uh, nonprofit advocacy and legal services organization. Um, so I've included our, our mission statements. Uh, we work to bring about fairness and justice for people with disabilities. Uh, to reach these goals, uh, we may file lawsuits on behalf of individuals or groups. We may investigate charges of abuse and neglect. Uh, we build peer and self-advocacy groups. Uh, we have a, a distinct um, self-advocacy unit, uh, one for developmental disabilities and the other um, for psychiatric disabilities. Uh, we advocate for change in laws, regulations, and public policy. And we provide information to those who may not know about their rights. So broad overview of what we do. Um, I mentioned that we have a number of regional offices. We're located, um, we have offices in Sacramento, uh, Oakland, our Bay office, Fresno, Los Angeles, and San Diego. And between our five offices, we, we cover all the counties. Um, our, the phone numbers for, to, to find out our phone numbers for the different offices, I'll put our website here in the text box. It's very similar to um, my email address. So I've just posted it. It's www.disabilityrightsca.org. The next slide is a few words about our assistive technology grant. Um, I mentioned that we, the regional offices primarily receive federal funding. Um, and so we do a, we conduct our work under a number of federal grants. And one is the Protection and Advocacy for Assistive Technology Grant. Um, so I've given you the text here of, of our funding source. And it also sets forth a little bit about what we do around AT. Um, and so the funding is to assist individuals with disabilities in the acquisition 
acquisition, utilization, or maintenance of assistive technology devices or assistive technology services through case management, legal representation, and self-advocacy training. So the, the last three are really the, the heart of what we do. Um, provide, like we do for other topics, we provide um, intake services, uh, referral, uh, brief service, we may assist someone um, with a, a call to a third party to try to find out more about what's going on or to straighten out a matter. Uh, we may provide legal representation, um, primarily special education, Medi-Cal issues uh, for AT, but provide also maybe technical assistance around Medicare. Um, and other funding streams for assistive technology. And then we provide self-advocacy training, what we're doing here today. On our website, we also have publications um, specifically about assistive technology. We have a manual that's about 16 chapters long, um, which I, I find quite helpful. I refer to quite often. Um, and then some smaller papers on, on more discrete topics. Okay. Let's, let's begin. Um, so Alan mentioned that I will be taking questions. Um, what I've done is um, broken the talk into distinct sections, um, smaller sections within the, the large topics to give space um, for questions. We, we did this last time with Medicare, and it seemed to um, be very helpful to, to everyone, the feedback that I received. OK. So first topic, we're going to look at federal and state laws. Um, so federally, there's two laws, two statutes, federal statutes that we're interested here uh, for anti-discrimination laws for employment. And the first is the ADA, and specifically Title I of the Americans with Disabilities Act. The second large federal statute is the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, specifically sections 501, 503, and 504. In California, we look to to two, two, thi two things. One is um, the Fair Housing and Employment Act, so a statute. And then we look to code, Government Code Section 11135. And we're going to have a bit of acronym soup today. So we have ADA, and then we have FEHA. Um, and FEHA, I think, is a trickier one to, to try to commit to memory. Um, because we will also have the Department of Fair Employment and Housing and with similar letters, and I think it gets, gets a little tricky at times. Okay, let's start with federal laws, the ADA and the Rehabilitation Act. Um, what I want to say here is the ADA and the Rehab Act are very, very similar in terms of content of protections and rights um, afforded to individuals with disabilities. Where the two are going to differ is in the remedy section, the complaint process. So let's look at the ADA. What are the basic requir requirements of Title I of the ADA? And I, here I have used bold text uh, intentionally um, to highlight the main points. First point, covered entities may not discriminate against a qualified person with a disability in the private sector and in state and local governments. And here the key words are covered entities. What does that mean? Qualified person with a disability. What does that phrase mean? We're looking at the private sector and also employees or prospective employees for state and local government jobs. And we'll, we'll talk, we'll kind of unpack these words in a moment. The second point, the ADA protects from uh, retaliation. So an employer may not retaliate against a person because the person has complained about discrimination or filed a charge of discrimination or participated in an employment discrimination investigation or lawsuit. Third main point is that employers must reasonably accommodate known that's the key word here, known physical or mental limitations of an otherwise qualified individual with a disability who is an applicant or employee unless, and these are the employee defenses we'll talk about, unless doing so would impose an undue hardship on the operation of the employer's business. 
So let's, let's take a look more at some of these keywords. Let's look at covered entities first. So who must comply with Title I of the ADA? We've talked a bit about that already. Private employers, employers of state and local governments, employment agencies, and labor unions. These four groups of employers are considered covered entities. Another part of the definition of covered entity is that there must be 15 or more employees for, for the protections of Title I to kick in. And the key again is that an employer cannot discriminate against qualified applicants or employees on the basis of disability. How broad reaching is Title I of the ADA when it comes to employment? Very broad. So the ADA, if it's one of the if it's a covered entity and there's fifteen or more employees, the full process of, of potential employment and employment are covered. Application for employment, promotions, testing that might take place, the hiring process, assignments, leave requests, benefits, and evaluation of the employee. So who is protected? Is it any person with a disability who's protected by Title I? Here again, we have some key language. As a lawyer, I always want to know what words mean. And so words on the surface may not always mean what we think they mean, and sometimes they do mean what we think they mean. So here the key phrase for who is protected is qualified individuals with disabilities. So the ADA tells us who an individual with a disability is. And that is a person who has one of the three following characteristics. Either has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities, or is a person who has a record of such impairment, or is regarded as having such impairment. The second piece is this word qualified. Qualified under Title I of the ADA means, oh, I just hit the keyboard by accident, I apologize. Skill, experience, education. We're going to look at other job related requirements that the employer has defined. And also who with the person with or without a reasonable accommodation can perform the essential functions of the job. So let's look more closely at what a substantial limitation is. Substantial limitation, the key phrase really here is the word broad. So it's a person who, because of the disability, there's a, a significant restri restriction in their ability to perform a class of jobs or a broad range of jobs, so class or broad range of jobs compared to the per a person without the disability who has similar training, skills, and abilities. Compare that to an applicant or employee who because of the disability is not able to perform a narrow or single task or requirement of the job. We're looking at the word substantial here. Substantial is broad, broad class, not just one narrow task. How do we determine what substantial limitation may be? We look at the big picture. Courts will look at the nature and severity of the impairment, the duration um, or expected duration of the impairment. Is it a temporary disability or permanent disability? Is there a permanent or long-term impact of the disability? And recently, there was um, a new amendment and some regulations, uh, sorry, uh, new act statute passed, the ADA Amendments Act, acronym ADAAA of 2008, um, that now says that 
mitigating measures such as assistive technology that is already being used or could be used by the employee cannot be considered anymore. So there's been this change in, in law and the regulations for the ADAAA were just issued a few months ago and I'll touch upon the highlights. Here we go. So the highlights of the ADAAA. Um, so the statute took effect in January 2009 and the changes that were made, the broadening and loosening up of the definition of disability uh, will not be considered retroactive. So we can't look back in time before January 1, 2009, but we can look forward. The changes under the statute apply both to the ADA and to the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 because again, they're, they're very close if not identical. Uh, the difference is the ADA and the Rehab Act apply to different types of employers. So the big deal with the ADAAA is that it loosened up uh, the definitions of disability and the intention was to make it a little more easier to, 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 to find disability and not be so much of a guessing game. The regulations that were just issued uh, came out of the EEOC and because this isn't a comprehensive training on the new regulations, I provided uh, the links for you um, of, of two sites. One is the EEOC itself so that you have access to the text of the regulations and also to the ADA National Network www.adata.org. So the key changes that were made recently to disability under the ADA are the following. We talked a bit a few minutes ago about substantial limitation. So under the new regulations, substantial limitation is now a lower degree of functional limitation. Um, than, than the standard that the courts had previously crafted and applied. And substantial limitation now is to be cons construed even more broadly and in favor of expansive coverage. And also new is that the determination of whether a, a person has a substantial limitation in a major life activity now requires that an individualized assessment to that person be conducted. And the fourth major change is that with a few exceptions, substantial limitations shall now be considered without regard to mitigating measures such as assistive technology, for example, or medications the person may be taking. Also new changes to make this easier is that a person who has an episodic disability or is in remission, for example, uh, their cancer is in remission, um, this now counts towards the analysis of substantial limitation. And the regarded as part of the definition, we, when we first began we talked about three ORs of definition of disability. Now regarded as has been folded into that definition of disability. And most importantly I think besides this overall concept that disability has been loosened up a bit is that to qualify for a reasonable accommodation the person with a disability um, must be covered under the, the actual disability, so has, a, has in fact a mental or physical impairment or the second prong, second or, the record of, has a record of, of having a disability. So I've, I've covered a large swath of the ADA and my caveat is 
um, that I would defer to very specific questions about the ADA to my colleagues here um, who focus more on, dis on discrimination laws than I do um, and to our publications. Um, and so you're welcome to call us um, and, and talk to someone. Um, I front loaded the presentation about laws just to situate us um, of what are we talking about here. Let me see if this will work in the text box. Uh, my text box is very small, but what I just posted was the uh, internet address for our um, discrimination publication, employment rights under the ADA and other related laws. And it's about a 68 page manual um, that I hope will be helpful. Um, that said, um, if there are any questions about Title I, um, I'm happy to, to field them. I've set the mics up and the telephone's open, so if you just raise your hand if you have a question or type it in the chat box. It looks like Owen is writing a question. And I, I can also read the um, I have a lot of feedback here. I can read I can also read the link for a publication if that's that's helpful as well. So Owen's question is, what does it mean that 15 or under employees are not covered? Um, what that means is they, that the employee or prospective employee cannot look to the ADA for protection. So the, the, the whole discussion we just had about Title I would not apply. Any additional questions? I guess we can move on. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read, read the link uh, because this manual is so comprehensive. Um, so it's our website, www.disabilityrightsca.org forward slash pub, P-U-B-S, forward slash 506801.pdf. And our, all of our publications are on our website, and so you, you could scroll through and find that there's something else that's helpful. Couldn't get it. OK, that's not correct. Go to disabilityrightsca.org and click on the publications link. See if that will take you to it. Okay. My apologies, I, I cut and pasted before the lecture today. Okay. Sh shall I proceed? No, that's not working. That's not correct either. I'm not sure what that is. Try www before the disability rights CA. Am I okay to proceed, Alan, or shall I wait? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, a few words about the Rehabilitation Act. Again, remember, the standards are going to be the same for the Rehab Act um, as Title I of the ADA. So this piece will be a short overview. So while the ADA looks to private employers and state and local governments, and unions. The Rehab Act provides protections for applicants and employees um, of the federal government. So the Rehab Act pro prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability in programs conducted by federal agencies, programs receiving federal financial assistance, so that could be a college, in federal employment, and also in the employment practices of independent contractors of, of the federal government. So the key question, who must comply? So Section 501 of the Rehab Act pertains to federal departments and agencies. So if this is an applicant or employee of a federal or department and agency, 
you're going to direct that person to Section 501 of the Rehabilitation Act. Section 503 um, prohibits discrimination by contractors and subcontractors with federal contracts of $10,000 or more. So similar to the covered entities question earlier, what happens if there are fewer than 15 employees? Well, here if the contract is for $10,000 or less than $10,000, Section 503 will not provide protection. And the third relevant section is Section 504, and that applies to any agency or business receiving federal funds. So here you're going to, to decide which law applies, you have to know about that employer. And it looks like you're, you're going to have to know more when it comes to the federal government connection. So I've given you the highlights of Section 501. It's going to look exactly the same as the ADA Title I, except here we're looking at federal departments and agencies may not discriminate against a qualified person with a disability. Employers may not retaliate against a person for the same reasons under the ADA. And federal employers must provide reasonable accommodations, again, unless doing so would impose an undue hardship uh, on a business. And there is one error in the first bullet. Um, so federal departments and agencies may not discriminate against a qualified person with disability in federal departments and agencies. So there's an error here. So ignore the private sector and st in state and local governments. I apologize. So again, it's, it's mirrored language. Section 503, again, applies to the contractors and subcontractors. We talked about this uh, briefly. And that's, again, I th my goal is just to give you the schematic today. Um, and Section 503 is enforced by the U.S. Department of Labor, uh, the Federal Contract Compliance Programs. And uh, the Department of Labor has a fact sheet, and I've provided the link in the webinar for more information. Section 504 is going to look similar again. Um, so again, we've got the key phrase, qualified individual with a disability. Um, so prohibited is discrimination against such people in any program or activity that either receives federal financial assistance or is conducted by an executive agency or the U.S. Postal Service. Each federal agency has its own set of regulations, um, of, of 504 regulations. So you have to identify what the program is to find the law. And that's where um, an, an attorney could be helpful here. Um, or also the websites of, of the agency itself or the Department of Labor. And one other thing that's different under 504 is each agency is responsible for enforcing its own regulations. Um, and that enforcement could happen through uh, a private lawsuit instead of a starting with a complaint process. So I think for ADA and the Rehab Act, we really want to know about the, the person having, who has a disability and more so really identify the characteristics of the employer. Does it fit under Title I characteristics, or does it fit under the Rehabilitation Act characteristics? And then from there, it's finding, are there additional regulations that will further define the rules um, the, of the program? Any questions about the very brief overview of the Rehabilitation Act? The lines are open. I guess we can proceed. OK. All right. Um, a few words about California law. Again, the two that we want to look at here is, that are relevant. First is FEHA, the Fair Housing and Employment Act. 
and the, sec the second one is section 11135 of the California Government Code. So a few words about FEHA. Um, even before the ADAAA, California law uh, was broader than the ADA. And FEHA tells us that employers may not discriminate against a person with disability in hiring, training programs, firing, compensation, other terms of and conditions of employment. So again, very similar to the ADA, that broad scope of the entire employment and potential and prospective employment spectrum. And here, the company does not have to have as many employees. So FEHA kicks in and provides protection when there are at least five or more employees. So that question earlier, if there's less than 15, then what? Is there some, some no, okay, you got the number left. Um, then you look to FEHA and see if the California law provides protection where the ADA may not. Are you, I'm seeing a note, is, is the echo coming from me as I speak or are you hearing a different echo? Let's see, I'm, I'm not hearing. Okay, I think it might okay. have been an open mic. Okay. Oh, someone's hearing the echo when I when I speak. Yep, more than one. It's better now. Let's see. Okay, I see. There was also a question about undue burden. We'll we'll talk about that under defenses. So we'll further define that. Okay. Um, lastly, who does FEHA ap apply to for employers who's covered? We're going to look at state. Um, state employers, uh, any city within California, and any political or civil uh, subdivisions of the state. So again, in, in, in additional ways that FEHA is more liberal and broader than the ADA is we spent quite a bit of time earlier fleshing out an analysis and factors for is there a substantial limitation? Um, and here, under, under state law, mere limitation satisfies the law for it to provide protection. So that analysis about substantial limitation and the word substantial and what goes into that may not apply here. And some also similar to the, the new changes to the ADA uh, under the ADAAA, um, we're not going to look at mitigating uh, measures so much. Um, and because FEHA is its own training, um, I provided uh, the link for uh, FEHA's, uh, about FEHA, um, and it's a publication called Disability Under the Fair Employment and Housing Act, FEHA, and that publication can be found at the California Department of Fair Employment and Housing. That's www.dfeh.ca.gov, um, and then look for publications. Uh, the link for publications. Oh, the, there's a question about unable unable to click on the link. That I don't think the links are live in the webinar. Is that is that the question? Yeah, we'll make them all available after the meeting. Okay. I'm not able to cut and paste uh, from the webinar either. Okay. So let's look at, you're welcome, let's look at the requirements under FEHA for employers. This is going to look similar again to what we've already discussed. One is that employers must provide reasonable accommodations again for applicants and employees who because of their disability are unable to perform essential job functions. 
FEHA also tells us that employers can't just sit there and take their own time in responding to a request for accommodations. Employers must um, work within a timely and good faith interactive process. And the key is always going to be that the employee or, or applicant has to announce, let it be known that there is a disability. The employer does not have to guess. There has to, it has to, they only are on the hook when the disability of the person is known to them. And again, if we look as a lawyer, let's look at the words timely, good faith, interactive. I think it's going to be fact, fact specific. How long is the employer taking? Maybe an employer who's taking 60 days might seem unreasonable, but maybe in those 60 days, they're actively working on the request and actively engaging with the applicant or employee. And again, the same defense applies. Employers do not have to provide everything asked for. They may assert the defense of undue hardship. CEHA gave us this phrase, this term of art, this legal language of essential job functions. So what does that mean here? We're going to look at whether the position uh, posted or as it is applies to the employee, does that position exist to perform that particular function? Are there other employees available to whom that function can be distributed or, or not? And is that function one that is highly specialized that only that person for this one job can perform? Now, we're also going to give some deference to the employer and how the job function is defined. We're going to look at wh what was the job description that was advertised before anyone even applied for the job. So objectively, what, w what did the job description include before it was even a possibility um, are known that someone with a disability was applying for the job. We're going to look at the employer's judgment, and part of that goes into what was the job description, how was it written, and what is the amount of time um, that that applicant or employee will be expected to perform that particular particular function. So again, we're looking globally, just like under the ADA and the Rehab Act. We need to know facts specific about this job before we can really analyze, um, you know, is it essential? Next topic is section 11135 of the California Government Code. Um, and the key point about this section is that the same protections of the ADA at the very least are provided for, and we're going to apply the same standard as the ADA. Uh, so that would be the substantial limitation, the definition of qualified uh, individual with disability. And here we're going to look at you know, what employees are covered. So is there direct funding from the state? Do they receive funds from the state? Are there at least five employees? And the dollar amount received by the state must be at least $10,000 per year or $1,000 per arrangement. So again, very consistent with FEHA. Much, much broader, looser standard for, for who um, is, what employees are covered. So better protection for the person with a disability. This was very brief, but I really want to spend more time on reasonable accommodations. Are there any questions about state law?
Alan, is anything being typed? I don't see it. I think everybody's following along. If you are, okay. would you? Yeah. So I, I think in summary for the law section, the walk away would be, or take away for today, what, what federal laws are, apply and are relevant, what state laws are relevant, what employers are covered, what are the characteristics of the employer, how many employees do they have, what is their funding source, if it's at all attached to the federal government or state government, and then what are the necessary characteristics of the applicant or employee with a disability? Okay, our, our next section, now we're getting into the heart of things, reasonable accommodations. So under the ADA, Title I, and therefore also under the Rehab Act, a reasonable accommodation is a, includes modifications or adjustments that enable that employee with a disability to perform their essential job functions. And we talked about this language earlier. An example would be a request for a type of assistive technology. And I just put a reminder at the page that throughout all this, we have to keep in mind that that applicant or employee meets the, the essential job functions um, with or without that accommodation. So, you know, their training, their education level, their skill set, with or without the accommodation meets the, the requirements. Okay. And I think this is also where we as advocates potentially come into this topic, is helping someone, um, giving them advice or troubleshooting the actual request for the accommodation. And I think the takeaway for me today would be the word negotiate. This isn't a mere demand and that it must be fit, you know, met squarely by the employer. It's a discussion. It's a negotiation. So a request for an accommodation can be made at any time from the job application process through the course of employment. So if an applicant requires an accommodation in order to complete the application process, they may ask. And the manual that I, our, our manual um, that I gave you the link for earlier walks through some examples about making such requests during the application process. And the other part about timing is identifying are there going to be any barriers in the workplace so that the applicant or employee can connect their request to the specific reason that they're asking for the accommodation. So it's identifying the workplace barrier that because of the disability uh, will prevent the employee or applicant from competing um, for the job or performing the task of the job, that essential job function. How do you ask an employer? You tell them. You, s you tell them that you have a disability and that you need an, ass an assistive device to do the work. You can ask for a meeting to talk about what you need. Again, in that idea that this is a discussion, it's a negotiation. The employer um, may already know about the AT being requested and may be very familiar with the type of disability. So maybe an agreement can be reached between the two of them right up front. Or maybe the equipment being asked for is really straightforward, it's not costly, and it's easily met. We strongly encourage people to document the process, to put their request in writing, and to document the conversations, the date, and who they talk to throughout the entire process in case that information is needed later for a complaint or an evaluation, a review. 
and to have the terms of the agreement also documented in writing. If an agreement cannot be met between the employer and the employee, then you may need to bring in an outside evaluator. So I've given some examples of what would be a proper or not, not so good request. Um, and here, similar to um, if, if you're familiar with requests, um, from Medi-Cal, for example, or Medicare, is this nexus. It's the because. You have to provide a connection between the disability and the person with the disability, the equipment, and what that AT will help that person do and why they need it. So an example of a, of a better request would be, I'm having trouble getting to work at my scheduled start time because of medical treatments I am undergoing. So medical treatments could clue in to that employer, wait a minute, that sounds like potentially the language of disability. And I, I'm noticing that Susie is not getting to work on time. There's a pattern to this. Ah, she's giving me a reason. It's because she's going. Uh, to the doctor. She's undergoing treatment for some reason. A request that really is not very strong would be, I'd like a new chair because the chair that I'm using is uncomfortable. And the reason, uh, thanks for joining Steve, I see your note, and I see the note about Jan also, and we'll get there in a second. Um, the reason this this example is not as strong is because that because is not there. It may very well be accurate and true that the chair is uncomfortable. Why is the chair uncomfortable? Is it because of the person's impairment? So here you would need, you know, I'd like a new chair. The current one I have is uncomfortable. It's causing me pain. It's causing me numbness. You know, because, for example, I have scoliosis in my back. So most essential is the nexus, is the because. And I think that's also a place that's right for us as advocates to work on with our consumers and clients is I often find when I talk to someone during an intake or out in the community, they'll say, well, I need this piece of AT. And I get it. I, I, I often get it. But what's missing is that articulation to the employer who may not be as familiar as we are with disabilities. And it's also important for, important for the purpose of documenting the request, that the because is there. It may not be common sense for the employer or their HR department. And so as advocates, I often find myself um, kind of teasing out the becauses and helping people articulate and frame the becauses. OK, sources for evaluations if more information is needed. So a couple things from the start. An outside evaluation is not a, a requirement. So the ADA does not tell us, tells us employers do not have to they don't have to accept these outside assessments that a person may get. One potential source for an assessment would be the department, California Department of Rehab. Um, while an employer does not have to accept an outside assessment, th there may be financial reasons why they may want to. And that may be, for example, that the Department of Rehab, DOR, may be a funding source, potentially, um, for that piece of AT. They may develop a, re a rehabilitation plan. And in order to achieve the goals of that plan, the AT is necessary. I would also suggest that you know, depending on the tenor of the discussion with the employer, may, it may be worth saying, you know, I see we're at an impasse here. 
um, or even not even saying that, just saying, would it be helpful to you? Would you be open to reviewing an assessment of my needs, of my disability, and of my job from an outside assessor? And you know, a credible, a very well established source could be the Department of Rehab. So again, I think this is where negotiation comes into play. And if the employer says no, there may be good merit to getting that assessment anyway to, again, document the request. In case there's a complaint, what, what was the employer on notice about? Often people ask about the role of a doctor in the request um, process. And if a doctor is involved, what rights protect this very private information of the employee? If a doctor is involved, does that now open the door for your employer to know everything about you? And the answer is no. Employers may know, they're entitled to know, about any physical or mental disability that affects your ability to do your job because of that disability. And that is the narrow scope. They are not allowed to go on a fishing expedition. They may ask for additional information, but again, they can't have it all. They can't just say, you know, give me the entire file on Hillary Sklar. It must be more pointed, and it must go to the heart of the job requirements. I've listed a few examples of this assistive technology. These are by no means exhaustive. But my hope here is that it shows somewhat of a range from very inexpensive to possibly more, in, more expensive. Uh, but by, by no means is this list exhaustive. So it, an accommodation for, of AT may be uh, providing access to, to TDD, telecommunication devices for the deaf, or an amplifier for their phone, or a special headset, a headset um, that has particular features. It may be um, providing, there's this example here of a one-handed can opener if the person is in food services. It may be a calculator that talks. It may be Dragon software. The key here is that cost in and of itself is not the main issue. It could range from something maybe the employer already has in their office, or again, something like a headset um, to something bigger. Cost is a factor when we look at undue burden. But there isn't a cap. The main point here is that the assistive technology must be directly linked to the job. And it may not be something that solely that employee needs for a personal reason. I've provided a link, and again, this won't be live, but Alan mentioned that they will make the links available to the EEOC's technical assistance manual. Um, and that's at the JAN website, they have that posted, for more examples of assistive technologies and how that may play out. A couple of considerations about reasonable accommodation requests. What about the employee that works full time but works part time at home? What do we do there about equipment? So there are circumstances when an employer may need to, may be on the hook to provide the assistive technology so that the employee can work at their home. However, they may not have to provide the same equipment twice um, so that, you know, Susie has this, the headset with the features that she requires in her office and also a second one at home. We're going to look to portability. And again, there are no um, flat answers. Everything is going to be fact specific to the disability, to the employer, to the job task 
that that AT is helping with. And the key one here is going to be portability. Do employers have to respond in a certain time frame? We looked earlier to FEHA, which talked about um, work timely. It must be an interactive process. So again, there's no specific time frame. But the emphasis here under the law is the word quickly. And I would say that would include an analysis of what, what things are the, are the employers doing. And that, in part, would be we would look to the notes from the person who asked. Um, and we just want to see that they're doing something, and it's in good faith. OK. Undue burdens, undue hardships. I said earlier that employers are not on the hook to, to meet every reasonable accommodation requested. And th the analysis here from the employer side is on the word reasonable. We as advocates use the word reasonable accommodation all the time. But we have to keep in mind that there's two words involved there, reasonable and accommodation. And a reasonable accommodation does not mean it's the best one. The standard is not the gold standard. The standard is that the accommodation would put the employer on equal footing, equal ground to their colleagues, not in a better position because of the AT. The employer may say, you know, yes, Hillary, I I see your point. I agree with you. A headset, I can see why um, a headset uh, with the following features would, would be beneficial here and would help you meet the job requirements. But you know, I found a headset that is not brand X. I found, I did a little research here, I found brand Y. It, it offers the same features, but it's a little less expensive. And they're allowed to do that. Another thing an employer might come back in response and say is, you know, that assistive technology that you're asking for, I think that looks more like it's for your personal use and not really for work-related functions. And an example there may be a particular type of wheelchair with particular features. How do we know what an undue burden or undue hardship is? Well, like most things, law related, there's going to be an analysis of factors. There isn't a square definition that tells us, yes, every time this is going to be an undue hardship. So we look to a number of factors. We look at the, the size of the employer. What, what are their finances? How many employees do they carry? And then also, we want to look at the cost of the accommodation requested. So that if you have an employer with five employees, they may not be required to provide the AT that costs $3,000 if that is disproportionate to what they could handle versus maybe an employer with 100 employees might be able to handle that $3,000 piece of equipment better financially. But again, it really is fact specific. We have to know about the employer. And we have to know about the assistive technology being asked for. OK, that was a lot. Um, any questions about, about the broad topic of, of reasonable recommendations and making requests? There was one question earlier from Owen about uh, Jan's role in doing evaluations. Um, is, is anyone familiar with, with Jan on the call and could answer that one? I'm not as familiar if Jan would be appropriate other than to advise to contact Jan and or to review their website. So off, off, the, off the cuff, I don't know. But if anyone else knows the answer, please feel free. OK. OK, so it looks like Jan is a good source. Uh, not just for, for training and publications, but for interactive 
uh, evaluations as well. Thank you. Any additional questions about asking for an accommodation, how to ask for one, how to document it, how to, what, what type of comebacks an employer would be allowed to use? So in, in summary, on reasonable accommodations, I, I just want to emphasize the word negotiate and the word nexus, and then documentation. So it's not truly a demand by the employee. They can fairly expect that there'll be some back and forth uh, about the discussion. It doesn't necessarily mean the employee has to give up their position outright, but it may mean there may be some tweaking to it. So again, it may be equipment that meets their needs, but may be a different brand. And I would say unless the brand that they asked for, there's a, a specific reason. Uh, for example, um, they know that headset brand X, uh, thank you, Helene, for putting up that website, um, that brand X may cost a little bit more than brand Y headset. But brand X is known to last longer, be more durable, um, and would be a better value in the long run for the employer. So I would say there's still some wiggle room there as well. OK, what happens if consensus, consensus is not met and the negotiation fails, the request fails? Thank you, Helene. Helene's posting um, phone numbers as well for voice and TTY. Thank you. Uh, so like anything, we want to look at some general considerations about this topic. And I think the takeaway for remedies today is who enforces what law, and then what are the requirements for filing a complaint, and the timelines. So first we want to know, well, we've talked about federal law today and state law. Where do I begin? So the ADA, the Rehab Act, FEHA and Section 11135 will, may have similar and different places to go. And again, if you walk away, if the takeaway today is nothing else, I want to emphasize process and timelines. OK. Do I file a complaint? with my state agency? Do I file a complaint with the feds? So I've set forth here some steps for an analysis. First, we want to determine what law covers the employee and the employer. So again, that we're going to look at the definitions we talked about at the beginning. And for the employer, the coverage, the employee coverage. So again, if that employee has less than 15, uh, the employer has less than 15 employees, we're going to look to state law to see if there's at least five. If there's more than 15, we may have a choice. So it may be that both state and federal law applies. And there might be a choice for which process to follow. We want to look to the state and federal agency for guidance. right? We want to know what are the rules. And are there any agreements already in existence? Um, about how complaints are handled. So the ADA has Title I, it has Title II, it has Title III, but different federal agencies enforce the different titles. So Title II of the ADA, we go to the Department of Justice. But for Title I, the one we're interested in for employment, we're going to the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And here, I would strongly advise contacting an advocate or an attorney, and that advocate may be you. So it may be, you know, you're talking to one of your consumers, and it may be, you know, I just want to let you know if you have any questions about complaints and kind of navigating, you know, the field about complaints, feel free to contact me or contact Disability Rights California or Jan or another advocacy um, or attorney. Uh, source. Okay, 
the EEOC, and this is where the acronym SOUP really starts in with remedies. So again, the EEOC is where we go to for enforcement of Title I of the ADA and Section 501 of the Rehab Act, and only Section 501. We need to know the language that the EEOC uses. I'm using the language of complaint in this training, but the EEOC calls it a charge of discrimination. Timelines. And here, even though I'm setting forth the timelines in this webinar, you must double check this on the website because maybe there's a change. So always look to the website of the federal or state enforcing body. So for now, the current timelines are a person must file their charge of discrimination within 180 calendar days from the date that discrimination took place. There's a caveat, an extension of time um, up to 300 days under some circumstances. But the emphasis here is really on this 130 day, 180 days. How are those 180 days calculated? Well, for the EEOC, they count holidays and weekends, except if the deadline falls on a weekend or holiday, they give you to the next day. And when I went to the EEO website, EEOC website to double check my numbers, on their own website, they strongly advised people to call a field office to help calculate these dates because they assert it could be very tricky. So for the ADA in California, you can also file an ADA complaint with the Department of Fair Employment and Housing, DFEH. And also what I found is that either organization, the feds or the state, will let you know which, one, which of their agencies will handle the complaint or charge. So I think the EEOC is a really good example of all the different ways rules can change, including language. The EEOC has a helpful guide um, on information about reasonable accommodations and dis disability discrimination, and I've posted their link there. I've also posted their link for how to file a charge of discrimination. Um, and they have a couple different websites, or web pages rather, about filing a charge of discrimination. Um, so while the second and third items on this page look similar, they actually contain different information. And I, and I also repeated the calendar days, 180 days here. Once the person files their charge, what can they expect? A range of things. Um, a spectrum. So EEOC may want to investigate. They may not. Um, if they do, their investigation may lead to mediation or dismissal of the charge. If they don't find a violation of law, they will send the person what's called a notice of right to sue. Um, the person who's filing the charge, that employee is called a complainant. And what this means is the EEOC conducted an investigation. They don't, file a viol they don't find that the law has been violated, but the employee has the right now to sue the employer. If, if the EEOC does find a violation of law, they will try to, to negotiate a voluntary settlement between the parties. And if that is not successful, they could refer that case to their own legal, st legal staff. So there's a number of steps that could happen. It doesn't mean all of them will. And here on this page, I've provided uh, the link for additional information about how the process works and what to expect. OK, let's look at state enforcement, DFEH. So this is the state agency that enforces employment and housing and publication, public accommodation uh, laws, as well as hate violence under FEHA. Here, we have a different timeline. Complaints of employment discrimination must be filed within one year 
from the date of the alleged discriminatory act. And they have a different process. Their process requires an, an interview with a DFEH staff. And so I've listed their process of uh, how to do this by phone, how to reach them, what the phone numbers are. You can also uh, make an appointment online. And th though these are not live links, my recommendation would be to go to the DFEH website, dfeh.ca.gov, and look for their online appointment system. DFEH has their own complaint process. I've provided the links here as well. Um, and same concept um, as EEOC of right to sue. Here, um, under the DFEH, they require, uh, sorry, FEHA requires, rather, that the employee exhaust all of the administrative remedies available to them first before proceeding with suing their employer. So what that means, administrative remedy means they must file a complaint. There may be certain steps that they have to take with their employer beforehand. Um, and here I would look to the specifics in the FIHA law and regulations for guidance about what administrative remedies is defined as, what all, everything that is encompassed under those remedies. OK. Uh, government Code Section 11135 has, surprise, surprise, its own process and its own timelines. So here the complaint must be filed within one year, similar to FIHA. Um, and it must be filed with the state agency that administers that program. So there isn't an overarching agency, per se, like DSEH or the EEOC. We have to figure out what agency um, administers the program that the employee is part of. Any questions about complaints? We're close to the end, so if you have questions, now's the time for them. I think Luke is sending you a question, and Helena. Oh, thank you. It says this has been great information. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm glad this is helpful. And Luke, are you uh, typing a question? The question is, don't you think it'd be easier if the law provided a scale similar to a tax scale for undue burden? <laughs> um, I, no, I don't know if it would be, I guess, easier as to whom. Um, but I think what we have to work with is each situation has its own, you know, just like every employee is going to be different and their disabilities, even employees with the same disabilities, they may um, impact that employee in different ways. We have to take the employers um, as they come as well. And I think this is also where, um, you know, if an employee does file a complaint or charge of discrimination, that's where the enforcement agencies come into play also. Was the assertion by the employer um, of undue burden reasonable? So I, I hope that's helpful um, because then you have you know, a third party charged with review and enforcement and assessment um, involved at that point and not one of the parties. But I also think as advocates and attorneys, um, 
you know, we may, you know, the undue burden defense may or may not pass our, our own tests, our own sense of what makes sense. Um, there may be, it may be times where, um, you know, as an attorney, I may say, you know, they may be right on this one. You, of course, have the right to file a complaint. But, you know, they're, they're saying, you know, this piece of equipment is very expensive for us. Uh, but they're willing to look at something less expensive. You know, um, client, consumer, are you willing to, to look at another piece of equipment? And if the answer is yes, fine. And if the answer is no, is the no because, you know, no, I really know that this piece of equipment is it. And then I would say, you really need to back up the reason why that specific brand at that specific cost is the one. And it's really similar to um, you know requesting assistive technology from Medi-Cal or Medicare again. It's documentation, evidence, documentation, evidence, and that nexus, that because. And, it, and if the, the discussion, if the negotiation, if the request fails, that's where the complaint process comes in, to have someone else review. Next question long one, let's see. I think it's also the case that we need flexibility because people's abilities, disabilities may change, just as job circumstances do. Would there be an issue if an employer provides an accommodation for a long-term employee but chooses not to provide a similar item or accommodation for a newer employee in a similar job? Could very well be. I, I can't answer that question squarely. You'd have to look at law to see if there's any case law on point. Um, and also the facts, again, of the employer uh, and the employee and did the circumstances of that employer change. But I would say that that, that question really needs further ana legal analysis um, to, to answer it properly uh, on a fact-specific you know, fact um, case. I have a couple more slides to go. Are there any, that's not to rush you. Um, it's just really going over some resources and, and final comments. Any, any other questions about complaints? Looks like, Kel, you'll have another comment. Oh, thank you. Uh, this is, uh, thank you. This has been very helpful. I, I'm, I'm very, very happy that, it, that it's helpful. OK. I'm going to go through a couple of resources. Um, that I've not covered already. So one is the JAN Job Accommodation Network and the website there, which was also posted earlier in the chat box. Um, I posted, um, in addition to our ADA manual, uh, Disability Rights California also has a comprehensive assistive technology manual, um, which I think I mentioned earlier. And chapter six is devoted to the topic of reasonable accommodations and employment. So what I would do, and what I have done, is I look to both Chapter 6 of the AT manual, and I also look to the ADE manual as well. Um, I found also this website, uh, Employment in the ADA Questions and Answers from AccessibleTech.org. Um, another resource available on the issues of AT and employment is the ADA National Network and specifically their Pacific Region ADA Center. Um, additionally, um, the U.S. Department of Labor has an Office of Disability Employment Policy, um, and they, that's ODEP, and they also have a separate unit for technology and people with disabilities, which is good to look at and interesting as well. Disability.gov has publications and training information um, about assistive technology and universal design in the context of employment and employment supports. And I provided that link as well. A question from Helena is, are all of these listed on the DRC website? No, they're not. Um, I, I pulled these separately for this training. Um, the, the, the Department of Labor ones and disability.gov are, are not. What, what you will find on our website um, is in our publications, uh, we have many, 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 many publications on a lot of different topics. Um, discrimination, 
assistive technology are just but two of our topics. Um, what we have, how our publications are, are um, posted is we have our in-house publications, so our disability rights generated publications, and then we have a link for other uh, references and resources. So some of these may be on there, but they may not be in such specificity as the ODEP technology website, for example. Um, Alan, I'm getting a pop-up window about saving a file. Right, the pop-up window is uh, for people who would like to have Hillary's slides. I've just posted them, and you can download and save them to your computer. Oh, okay. So I, I don't need to do anything. Oh, sorry, I talked over you. I apologize. Uh, I don't need to do anything with this. Uh, you don't, Hillary, but uh, other people, if they want your slides, do. <laughs> okay. If I click no, is that just me, or does that impact anybody? Yeah, just you. Okay, thank you. I was afraid to touch anything. Um, so uh, just any final questions? I, again, this was a lot of information. It was designed as, a, as an overview, as a framework. You know, what laws do we want to look at? Which ones are relevant? Timelines, what remedies? What are the, the responsibilities of that employee to put, you know, to put the, the prospective employer or current employer on notice? How to frame a really strong request? to expect that it could be a discussion, a negotiation, what happens if that doesn't work, what are the person's rights, what are the timelines, where can we find additional information. So I hope that's what you walk away with today, the takeaway with you today. Um, this has been enjoyable as always, I, and thank you for having me again for another AT webinar. Um, I, you can feel free to, to contact me um, if, you're in, if you're south of LA, uh, call San Diego office. If you're north of the LA, um, you can call the Bay office or Sacramento office. If you're more inland in Central Valley, that would be Fresno. You can call any one of us, and if you're not in the right catchment, they'll just tell you who to call. And, and also go to our website, and I hope that that's helpful. So thank you very much.